All right, welcome back to this afternoon session. Um, for those of you just joining us for the first time, live or virtually, uh, this is the Summer Systematics Institute Final Research Symposium. Um, the, Summer Research, the Summer Systematics Institute is our National Science Foundation Research Experiences for Undergraduates program here at the California Academy of Sciences. Uh, and what we're focused on is training the next generation of scientists for the field, the lab, and sharing their science. Uh, really, our vision here at the California Academy of Sciences is that, uh, of what a 21st century scientist should look and be and act like. Um, we think that it's important for people to be not only good at science, but good at sharing their science with the world. And so that's what we're doing here in this symposium today. Um, the interns that you're hearing from have been at the Academy for nine weeks in this program. Uh, they started out with their first week in the field, uh, really up close and personal from, from day one, sleeping in two-person tents. Uh, then we came back here to the Academy where they received training uh, in collections, in lab uh, genomics research, in morphological research, uh, really understanding the whole scope of a project from sort of conception all the way through to analysis and now finally presenting their results. Uh, I'm Dr. Lauren Esposito and I co-direct this program with Dr. Rebecca Johnson. Uh, and both of us are actually alum of the Research Experiences for Undergraduates program uh, way back when, when we were undergraduates. And so really understand and appreciate the pathway of the Research Experience for Undergraduates program for young scientists or science communicators uh, or educators or, or any real direction that, that young people go. And I, I think um, one thing that, that's really apparent through the 28 years of this program is that people leave here and go in all sorts of directions, but make really meaningful impacts on both science and society. Um, the students that we'll be hearing from in this afternoon session are part of a cohort uh, of nine that beat out over 500 other applicants to this program. Um, this is a really competitive program, so the people you're hearing from are really sort of the best and the brightest uh, that we've managed to convince to come here and, and have this experience with us at the Cal Academy, um, and that we hope will be our colleagues forever. Actually, there's lots of uh, alum in the audience right now from various years. Um, so once once you're in, you're, you're sort of in forever at the Cal Academy. Uh, so I think without further ado, unless you have anything to add, Rebecca? No, I'm just happy to hear um, to be here with everyone and celebrate um, this awesome work with our last four presentations. I look forward to hearing everyone's what everyone did this summer. So if you're tuning in live, don't forget that you can ask questions in the chat and we'll read those questions out um, here in, in the room. And, and so you can ask the speakers questions directly. Uh, and so I think I'll introduce our first speaker. Uh, which is, let me pull up my agenda, <laughs> which is David Canseco, who will be speaking about the population structure of Lathis maculina in the southeastern United States. Uh, David was mentored by Dr. Sarah Cruz uh, and Kate Montana, sitting right here in the audience, uh, but also with the whole arachnology lab. Um, and he's joining us from soon to be uh, UC Riverside, starting in the fall. David. Thank you so much for that great intro. I'm very happy to be here um, and share my project that we worked on this summer. <clears throat> so, uh, the name of my presentation is uh, we're looking into the population structure of Lathis uh, maculina, which is a spider that resides in the southeastern United States. And like uh, Dr. Esposito mentioned, I, this summer I worked with Dr. Sarah Cruz in Cape Montana, along with the Esposito Arachnology Lab to get this project underway. And I'm happy to present this. So <clears throat> most people do not really know, understand, or I guess appreciate the study of spiders uh, due to their appearance or maybe their fear-based ideology. Um, but I feel like most of these paradigms can come from a place of lack of knowledge about these animals. Um, I feel like it's an important, important to get an understanding 
in order to bring appreciation. I've learned this summer that they're very interesting creatures with very different behaviors, uh, mating rituals, and just morphology that's very, very interesting to me. Um, and in fact, uh, these uh, spiders, but specifically lathis, are pretty understudied. Um, they're hard to find because they're very, very small. And they're pretty hard to ID because there's just an overlap in the known species. Um, Lathis is a genus of spiders in the family Dictinidae. It was first described by Jean Simone in 1884. And they're typically found in leaf litter, uh, tree bark, leaves. They build some pretty irregular webs close to the ground or near where there are in order to catch their prey. Um, when the first, when the species was first described, there, there wasn't a whole lot of illustrations that were put out, which makes it hard for us to identify them today. <clears throat> uh, like I said, they're made up of, uh, the genus is made up of 54 species that are found throughout the whole Arctic. Nine of them are in North America. And the whole Arctic is just this biogeographic realm that makes up the majority of the habitats that are found in the Northern hemisphere. It's the green area in the map. Um, it's likely that due to their cryptic lifestyle and the size, their, their small, small size, there are likely several uh, undescribed species and understudied uh, areas for sure. Uh, many of the species have overlapping distribution, which again can be dis difficult to distinguish them due to old and well, poor illustrations. Uh, old doesn't have anything to do with that. Um, some species have also only been collected a handful of times and there's not a whole lot of um, collected material for us to look at or even come across. <clears throat> Spiders are usually differentiated through their genitalia. Um, recent morphological studies demonstrate that lathis have a very high complex palpal structure, um, which they have you know, several features unique for the family as well as for spiders uh, who tend to have complex palps in general. Um, the genitalia is how their spiders are identified. Uh, the images that we have here make the identification much more difficult because as you can see, I have two different species, um, but the images in the palps are pretty identical. If I were to cover these up and see what the difference are, they'd be pretty hard to find. And that's kind of what it's like when, when you're IDing uh, the species that you come across. <clears throat> so the focus of the study is to look at Lathis maculina. They're arranged in the Eastern US and like their relatives, their cousins, they're a very, very small spider. In fact, when they were, their first diagnosis was pretty much only describing their size. Um, that's all they had is just 20 females from 1.3 to 2 millimeters in size and just some color descriptions. I think that text says they're pale and sometimes whitish, um, but that's pretty much what they had to go off of. <clears throat> so to, uh, sorry, I lost my slide. So adding to the complexity uh, of the species, some there's a pretty wide distribution. Um, maculina is recorded throughout the eastern U.S. and the highest, uh, the northernmost collected point of it was in New Jersey. So we would like to know if they are moving, if they're moving freely whether there is a structure to the populations that could even represent some cryptic species we may have not learned about just yet. Um, I know that six of the eight other species in the genus overlap in distribution, which makes IDing much more difficult. We can't really just go to a location specific and find a species that we know is there. We have to find whatever we come across. Um, so yeah, the, the size of them is it's really, not a, a helpful way to describe them. So we're hoping to get the study and use the genetic information to see where we can place these spiders. Um, like I mentioned, they're very, very tiny. Uh, the average size for them is around two millimeters. There's about 60 of them in that dish there that I had to you know, sort through and put in different vials. It was very, very tedious. I think it's pretty funny. The largest person in the cohort had the tiniest <laughs> organism to study. Um, so it was definitely a learning curve to get the tiny forceps down there. Um, 
which is also pretty cool to see that uh, spiders, when they're identified, they develop their genitalia as adults. So when we have a lot of juveniles, they're really difficult to almost impossible to identify because they look like just tiny little white pillow like um, little balls um, prior to the to adulthood. Um, so we have to sort them and look for those uh, characteristics. <clears throat> Another way to tell our spiders apart is by looking at their eyes and the coloration in their abdomen. These particular spiders have six eyes arranged in two groups of three eyes on each side, um, which is not right for or correct for all lathies. Some have eight eyes, um, but or not that arrangement. They have uh, six eyes, but the arrangement tends to differ. This specific Mechalina has them in two sets of three. Um, so our study is uh, going to be looking at, hopefully grow the knowledge of this organism by studying them across the Southeastern US, by looking at the different morphological differences, their abdomen, um, colorations, which also comes in in adulthood. Again, the juveniles are very pale and translucent looking. Uh, the approach for this study was <clears throat> to collect uh, spiders from this uh, southeastern region. The three uh, states that were sampled were Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. Um, the original recorded distribution that's on the left shows them in that general area as well, which was from the original publication. Um, Lathis maculina and Immacula Immaculata seem to have show actually an overlap in their areas of distribution for the collected samples. So doing this small region of study on the population structure will give us an idea of how related they are in this general area or if proximity matters to their relationship. <clears throat> the approach for this was um, the collab my collaborators went out into the field prior to the summer and collected from several locations uh, across the country. They collected the leaf, uh, by putting leaf litter into a Winkler funnel that's here on the left. It hangs suspended under a light bulb the heat causes the spiders to migrate into the ethanol reservoir. And from there, you do some identifying on the left. You separate all the different families that you've collected and hopefully find some lathis in there. <clears throat> the hypothesis pretty much for this study was, we believe that the population structure will correspond to the geography. We believe that if you're located near each other, or we suspect that if you're near each other, once we do your molecular, the molecular uh, research for that, that they could be related to one another, more that they are related to the group that's further away. So again, with spiders that live in cross proximity to each other, be more closely related, related to the ones that don't. The methods for this was we sampled about 48 spiders, tiny one and a half millimeter spiders. We removed four of their legs um, and try to remove, extract some DNA from them. We did um, extraction, DNA extraction, PCR amplification, and then we sequenced all the way through by processing uh, our data through maximum likelihood and uh, Bayesian. Uh, we sequenced around 600 base pairs of the CO1 gene. About 13 of those resulted in sequences. Um, some of them we took sequences from GenBank in order to illustrate the less related uh, species. And what we found is essentially there are two clades, one for Immaculata and one for Maculina. Um, the, immacu the Maculina one seems to have some pretty short branches uh, that suggests they've not been uh, differentiated for a whole long time. <clears throat> and despite the similarity between Immaculata and Maculina, they're both uh, monophyletic we see little population structure in Maculina. Like I said, the clade has really short branches. Um, it is also divided into two clades, but nothing really matches up with the geography. Closer in distance does not necessarily mean right now for the study that they're more closely related uh, molecularly. And both of these populations are geographically distant. So populations, locality nine and five, which is my red and the blue here are pretty far from one another, but genetically they're a lot more closer together than the ones that are near them. Um, this could be perhaps a sampling situation. 
Um, we need more, we would like to see more samples to see if we can have a wider um, data uh, collected. And even though the species here, we're gonna focus in a little bit more on Maculina. Even though they're very similar species, they have a lot of uh, reproductive variation, especially in the females. Um, you see differences within the species we've observed. Um, the males tend to be more uniform uh, in the palps. The variation is not as much within lathis, and I've learned also within spiders. It's the you'll see a lot more um, morphology variation in the females. Here are uh, very different pictures of again similar same species with quite different um, copulatory ducts and copulatory openings. The conclusion is pretty much we've seen that right now, as of now, we don't have a whole lot of structure in the populations of Maculina. Uh, the geography does not correspond to the molecular or morphological data. And there's a lot of genitalic variation in the females and in the males. Um, this is a good thing potentially to study because you have a pretty clear canvas. We need more collections, um, bigger samples to see if there's actually a deeper relationship with these spiders or if they're you know, similarly genetically and differently morphologically. Um, the next steps again would be a larger sample, some more localities across the, the observed range, look at type specimens also because like I said earlier, the uh, images we have from the original descriptions are not very helpful as we saw there. And if we can look at the morphology and maybe find some key characteristics to compare to other things, we might be able to further uh, find species. And then the next one also would be look at the internal morphology of the female genitalia. It's, it's pretty complex and very variable. Uh, we might be able to find some key things and key differences in those areas there. Um, next is the acknowledgments. I would like to say thank you to Dr. Lauren Esposito and Rebecca Johnson for being amazing directors of this program. Um, Sarah Cruz, uh, Kay Montana, and Jacob for being great, great mentors and putting up all the questions, endless questions. Um, Athena Lamb and Lynn Bonomo for honestly saving us in the CCG, constantly <laughs> listening to the rants and the, the freakouts and the fears of amplif amplifying uh, genes. And the collection managers, um, all the people that gave us great lectures and showed us all the things that we saw throughout the museum. We really got a great look at what it's like to work in a museum that we grew up going to in a lot of our cases. Um, I would like to continue to thank uh, the California Academy of Sciences, uh, National Science Foundation for funding this program, getting us here. And um, also I'd like to thank the Aragner's lab, the Esposito lab for providing such a work, welcoming work environment. Um, we, we felt welcome since the very first day. And also all the other interns. Uh, this program was amazing with all you here, every single one, and thank you for the experience. <laughs> Questions? I'm so happy to. <laughs> That is like a mascot for changing worlds, the world appreciation for spiders. <laughs> um, and I was also really impressed with your success rate for getting genetic sequence data and well supported trees out of some tiny, albeit fresh samples. So, congratulations. Thank you. So, my question is um, how, are these those little cute spiders the balloon for dispersal? And do you think that could be one of the reasons how the the young disperse that is decoupling a genetic and geographic signal? That is a great question. I am actually not entirely sure about that dispersal. I did not dig too deep into how they they tend to move around. Um, but it, it's very interesting to see the way they are dispersed. And if the ballooning does have anything to do with it, it would explain the distances that we do see them get to. Um, yeah, I'm interested to learn that. Great time. Following up on the um, 
question about the sort of patchwork within this uh, Maculina. Do you think that the reason is uh, phylogenetic signal is low, so more data will actually help you see geographic structure, or there's just no geographic structure? You know, we believe that if we have more data, we might be able to sequence. We had, from the samples we had, we had a few sequences that we were able to to put together and look at. And I, so I do believe having more of a database and having more samples to look at um, would help us. <laughs> Great job. Um, Thank you. Just a quick question. Where is the pipe specimen uh, out of curiosity? Yeah, that yeah. <laughs> it is good question. Thank you. It is located in Paris, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Next up. Okay, next we have Chloe Allen uh, joining us from the University of North Georgia. So we were just looking at a map of her hometown. Uh, she'll be speaking about genetic tools and morphology, clarify the identity of mystery puddle frogs in natural history collections. Uh, and her supervisor was Dr. Raina Bell. All right, so thank you, Lauren. Um, like she said, I am Chloe Allen, AKA Frog Chloe, not to be confused with Beetle Chloe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am from Georgia and this summer I did my project on gen using genetic tools and morphology to identify mystery puddle frogs, find a petrachidae in Academy collections. So the mystery. The family Phanopatrachis is known to display high interspecies morphological variation as well as low interspecies morphological variation, making it difficult to distinguish between species in the field. Specimens are frequent, frequently misidentified, causing confusion within the study of Phanopatrachis species. The Academy has hundreds of unidentified Phanopatrachis spa, or lots of little brown frogs. <laughs> So, and it's understandable why this might happen. Little brown frogs are very challenging to tell apart. So I'm gonna have you all be herpetologists for a brief moment. How would you describe these frogs in the field? Would they be same or different families? So raise your hand for same family. And different families. <laughs> They're indeed different families. <laughs> This leads us to another issue within the study of African frogs. Arthroleptis and Phrynobotrachus specimens are easily confused with one another, even though they are distant re distantly related families of frogs. So some history on Phrynobotrachus. Phrynobotrachidae is endemic to Africa, ranging from West, East, Central, and South Africa, as well as three islands off the coast of Central Africa, Sao Tome, Principe, and Bioko Islands. There's still a lot of basic taxon, oh, let me back up. Former SSI intern, Joseph Ueda, described the species endemic to Sao Tome Island with his mentor, Bob Drews. I thought I'd add that in there. There's still a lot of basic taxonomy and systematics research ongoing in this group that unfortunately presents a lot of challenges to researchers due to the previously discussed morphological similarities within Phrynobotrachidae and potential for confusion with Arthroleptis. Once again, both groups of little brown frogs. <laughs> Within the family range is the Cameroon volcanic line, which has created the perfect environment for the creation of separated microhabitats. These lush and unique ecosystems are thought to have led to the Cameroon radiation of Phrynobotrachidae. Several new species have been described from this region in the last 10 years, and there are likely more undescribed species, making this a very active area of research. Often, these specimens collected in the field will end up as Phrynobotrachus spa in the collections because a collector would be 
very uncertain about their ID in the field because they all look the same. So what were the goals of my project? The goals of my project were to sequence and align the 16S mitochondrial DNA gene for Phrynopotrachus spa specimens in the Academy collections, followed by blasting or running my acquired sequences through the DNA database to find the closest species match to my sequences. Next, I wanted to compare specimen, my specimen to know morphology of their closest match using field guides and other literature. Finally, I wanted to compare these identified species specimen sequences alongside reference sequences archived in GenBank, focusing on our current understanding of species relationships and distributions. So my methods. First, I was to extract DNA from liver or muscle samples from my specimens. That's depicted in that first figure right there. After this, primers which target the 16S gene were added to my samples and the 16S gene was amplified using PCR amplification. Mitochondrial DNA presence and quality was measured using gel electrophoresis. So you can see the gel down there. Once I was sure of the gene presence, my samples were added to the ABI sequencing machine, which produced a digital file of the 16S gene sequence for my samples. Genius was used to clean and align DNA sequences as well as produce a phylogenetic tree depicting similarities and relationships between the species of Phrynopotrachus. After obtaining that 16S mitochondrial DNA sequence for all my specimens, I ran the sequence through BLAST, the DNA database, to more closely analyze the identity of my specimens. I compared my specimens to the closest match species morphologies. I measured snout vent length as well as accounted for the presence of tubercles, which is depicted in figure A and B, um, foot webbing, C and D, um, toe pads, E, and then chevron-shaped dorsal lateral ridges and figure H, which are all known to be distinguishing morphological characteristics of Phrynopotrachus. With this data, I was able to identify most of my specimens to the species level. Some other ways of distinguishing between species of anurans or frogs is by comparing their unique and distinct mating calls as well as measuring and observing skeletal morphology. These types of data weren't available for the specimens I was working with, but could be available in the future. So what were my results? Phrynopetrachus spa were indeed Phrynopetrachus and not Arthroleptus, so that was great. Um, Right here, you'll see a neighbor joining tree of the 16S gene with my sequences represented by the colored branches and the reference gen bait sequences matching the color of the branches. Some of the species that I identified were P. gutterosis, P. parvolis, P. natalensis, P. auritis, and P. africinus. Some of my samples were a very close match to a reference sequence and some were more distantly related. So I'm gonna walk you through a couple of examples of the types of results I got. So the first species I wanna speak on is P. parvulus. Um, this is a live photo and then my specimen photos right here. After comparing my specimen collection location, which was in Burundi, to the known distribution of P. parvulus, I learned that the specimen was collected slightly north of the species known distribution in Southern Africa. This may suggest that the species occurs in a slightly larger area than was probably known, which is a surprising, surprising given how little we know about the species of Phrynopotrachus. Next, I want to speak on an extremely morphologically diverse species, which I sequenced P. auritis. The length of the branches and the number of clusters reflect the genetic diversity of this group. And you can see there is also a lot of morphological diversity in the live and preserved specimens. So yes, these are all the same species. This intraspecies morphological and genetic diversity is a reflection of the geographic range of P. auritis. This is because the populations I examined are separated by the Cameroon volcanic line and include samples from Bioko Island. These geographic barriers decrease the likelihood of gene flow between populations and lead to genetic divergence between populations. Another group who displays a high rate of genetic and morphological diversity is P. natalensis. 
They are so cute. <laughs> <laughs> This diversity is also a reflection of the wide range of P. natalensis who inhabits a range of ecosystems allowing for that genetic divergence within the species. And lastly, I wanna speak on P. gutterosis. Um, they're kind of my favorite because they have these cute little belly spots. <laughs> these specimens, P. cf. gutterosis, and cf. is used um, if we are a bit unsure about the identity of the specimen. And P. aritis were collected at the same locality and probably thought to have been the same species because they were placed in the same jar in the collection. However, upon sequencing, these specimens were found to be distantly related with the P. cf. gutterosis being about a 95% match to its closest reference sequence. P. gutterosis is a West African species and my sample was collected in Cameroon. That's in Central Africa. So this means that my specimens could be an unsequenced sister species of P. gutterosis, or P. gutterosis has a larger range than it's currently documented. So why do we care about puddle frogs? There are a lot of unknowns in the family Phrynobotrachidae, from vastly different intraspecies morphologies to extremely similar interspecies morphologies. This group is severely Understudied, understudied, and the basic biology of most species is still poorly understood. However, in order to protect species, we need a solid understanding of their evolutionary relationships, distributions, and life histories to minimize the impacts of threats like deforestation, habitat fragmentation and loss, and climate change to inform successful conservation man management strategies. So future directions. In this that picture, man, so cute. <laughs> so my mentor, Dr. Raina Bell, is working with two PhD students in Cameroon, Oscar and Abraham, who are studying the impacts of amphibian chytrid fungus on the amphibian community in Cameroon. They are coming to the academy in October, and they have toe clips and hands of the frogs that they're swabbing, and they'll be DNA barcoding them in the CCG lab, just as I did with my specimens. So having my barcoded specimens is an important reference for them to compare their results and confirm their, ID, their field IDs of the frogs that they're catching. Additionally, some specimens I sequenced didn't have a close genetic match to reference species sequences. This may mean that sequences do not yet exist for the species or that the academy specimen is an unidentified species. <laughs> Additionally, some specimens I sequence, oh wait, I already got that. <laughs> More DNA distribution and morphological comparisons will be made to figure out what is happening with these unknown species. And hopefully we'll have the entire family sequenced soon. So I just wanna say thank you to everybody that's been depicted up on this screen. And most importantly to the puddle frogs for their great sacrifice to science. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, I would have to say that it is a reflection on the loss of coloration within like preserved specimens, because as you all may know, uh, ethanol like drains colors from these specimens. So that does make it like a lot more difficult. And very rarely are they identified to species level in the field because although their habitats are like different, they're also very similar, leading to very similar morphologies as a reflection of ad adaptations to those similar habitats. Thanks so much, Glenn. That was great. And I'm wondering, like, after you have the sequencing results and you look back at the frogs, like, in your hands, could you start to see some morphological differences? I know you showed us some in the pictures, but mm -hmm. were you like, oh, 
like now I can tell. Yeah, about. especially when I was comparing them to like the field guide morphologies, um, I was seeing those differences. Once again, um, they weren't all present. There's some coloration remarks made in the field guide that obviously were not present in my specimens, but the tubercles, the ridges, um, femoral glands, those were all there. So. That was great, Claire. Thank you. Um, I was uh, going to ask you. You mentioned that the end climate change and habitat loss, and I wondered if you could reflect. I think at least two of your specimens were collected out of range, and you you speculated maybe they had a larger range. But do you think maybe they just have a more northernmost range, or or a different kind of range shaped by climate change or habitat loss, or could you speculate? Um. I feel like that would be a difficult speculation to make at this moment, but I wouldn't completely deny that hypothesis at all. Um, we do know that habitat fragmentation affects organisms in very dramatic ways and ways that causes them to change their distributions. Okay, I'm dying to read this really cute note from your mom. <laughs> 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 and ask this question from Emily, who would like to know, in order to determine if a cast CF specimen is actually a new species, how many more specimens would you need to confirm? Mm, that's a good question. Um, we would definitely need like a larger sample set um, to throw into that tree that I had mentioned previously. Can I say that? Yes, so you know, in science, the bigger the sample size, the more confident you can be in your results. So we would need lots and lots and lots more sequences from lots and lots and lots more puddle frogs to be able to determine the identity of that species solely based on evolutionary relationships within the family. Yeah, that's it. All right, thank you. All right, so we've heard about little brown spiders and little brown frogs. Uh, and now we're gonna switch gears a little bit um, to, to hear from our Wallace supported student here at the Cal Academy. We have a, a, a program to support undergraduate research um, that's endowed, uh, it's called, we call it the Wallace Fellowship. Uh, and, and each year we uh, invite a student into the SSI program to be fully embedded in the SSI program. Um, in past years, that's been a scientific illustration intern uh, but for the last few years, we've we've switched, uh, and we've had a, a student actually embedded with our digital engagement team. Uh, shout out to our digital engagement team who's here running this live stream behind the scenes. Uh, and so this year, we're going to hear from Clarissa Lamb, uh, who's joining us from Reed College, supervised by Laurel Allen and Arya Natarajan. Uh, and she'll be speaking on improving visitor perceptions of scientific collections using short form video content. All right. All right, yeah, thank you for the introduction, Lauren. Um, my name is Clarissa Lamb. I'm coming from Reed College. I'm an incoming senior. Um, and I conducted a study and it's titled Improving Visitor Perceptions of Scientific Collections Using Short Form Video Content. All right. So what does science social media look like? Um, there are a lot of 60 second vertical videos that are populating a bunch of different social media platforms right now. It originated mainly on TikTok, but you can find it on YouTube, Instagram, everywhere. And um, this is a way to convey a lot of information in a short amount of time. And there are quite a few institutions similar to ours that are using this platform um, in order to share their information. And so the Field Museum in Chicago has some content that actually features specimen collections and the Monterey Bay Aquarium, San Diego Zoo have very popular channels with a lot of different animals. But while the Feed Museum had a video or two that featured their scientific collection, there isn't a lot of content out there. Um, and when I was trying to come up with a study for my um, summer, uh, I you know, was looking through our own Instagram and I came across this video, Is It a Frog? Um, with Herpetology Collection Manager, Lauren Scheinberg. 
And, you know, Lauren is playing around with some of the different herps that we have in our collection, um, which are obviously dead specimens. And this one comment caught, uh, caught my attention. This one kid said, they might not all be toads, but they are all dead. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I thought, wow, that's, that's, a strong, that's a strong reaction to a 60 second video. Um, and so I started, you know, wondering a few questions. And so I was wondering, you know, what are visitors uh, feelings toward and associations with scientific collections or specimen collections? Um, and just a heads up, I'm going to use scientific collections and specimen collections interchangeably. Um, and I wondered, could a short video, a short form video shift those feelings in a positive direction? And is one video approach more effective than another? Um, and so in the end, I created three videos in that 60 second vertical style, and I designed and distributed a survey um, and, you know, a third of the respondents would get one video, another third and another third. And I decided to try and reduce some bias in my study. I would try and focus on a single protagonist. Um, and I actually chose the Xerxes blue butterfly, which another student here, um, Alize, who's going to present after me, studied this summer. And so I had a bit of a baseline knowledge already about it. And the Xerxes has a very rich history and a current impact, a current real world impact. So there was a lot of content for me to work with and a lot of different angles and approaches I could choose. Um, and so my first video took the approach of kind of, we call it the aesthetic video. Um, it focused on the butterfly's morphological features and included visually appealing footage. The second video um, was the impact video. It's kind of the opposite. It's supposed to be more information heavy. Um, it centers the real world impact that the Xerxes continues to have as scientists use it to inform a critical um, habitat restoration project. And the third video um, was actually not focused on the Xerxes, but it was focused on, on the entomology collection still, and Chris Grinter, who's the um, entomology collections manager, as he speaks about his first experiences collecting specimens and um, just, you know, trying to highlight the people behind these collections. And so we're actually going to watch all three videos. Um, and yeah, is audio hooked up to it? Yeah, okay, cool. And so let's see. All right. Yeah, Many of the specimens in the California Academy of Sciences collection are incredibly beautiful, but even the ones that don't catch your eye may just catch your breath if you take a closer look. At first glance, this little butterfly looks just like millions of others scattered across North America. Their iridescent blue scales and the spots on the underside of their wings can tell a story about where they came from. And while all silvery blue butterflies have these traits in common, only the Xerxes blue butterfly from San Francisco can have pure white spots. The tiniest specks of white cast the Xerxes in a new light, and as we peel back another layer and peer into the history of the Xerxes, it isn't just its spots that make it unique. The Xerxes went extinct over 75 years ago, which means that collections such as this one are our only windows into the history of this butterfly. Collections are libraries of life on Earth, and the Xerxes is just one of millions of stories waiting to be unfurled with a closer eye and a little time. And then the impact video? How does an extinct butterfly change the landscape of San Francisco today? Well, over 75 years ago, these little butterflies flitted across the dunes that used to span the city. As San Francisco developed, the dunes were paved over, causing the butterfly's food source deerweed to disappear and the butterfly with it. Now they only exist in scientific collections like these at the California Academy of Sciences. They're known as the Xerxes Blue Butterfly. Today, scientists, land managers, and local butterfly enthusiasts are restoring the dunes and the species that used to call them home from plants to the butterflies that pollinate them. Luckily, deerweed still exists throughout California and has already been reintroduced to San Francisco. But how do you replace a butterfly that's long extinct? Specimen collections allow scientists to sequence the Xerxes and other blue butterflies DNA to identify a close genetic relative, one that also feeds on deerweed and can fill the same critical role Xerxes did. There's still plenty of work to do, but if someday you're walking through a stunning dune habitat in San Francisco and see little blue butterflies, Thank the Xerxes and the power of scientific collections. The personal video, which is mainly an interview with Chris Grinter. One museum, over 46 million specimens, and a small group of very unique humans who take care of them all. Today we're meeting one of them. Entomology collections manager Chris Grinter cares for beetles, butterflies, and more. And like most kids, Chris began collecting bugs at a young age. From as young as I can remember, I was always catching bugs out in the fields behind my house. and basically never grew out of it. You know, birds, you could learn your backyard birds in an afternoon. Insects, you could literally spend your entire life discovering the biodiversity of your backyard and get nowhere close to coming to a better understanding than basically when you started. You can go in your backyard and discover new species. I, I have a few specimens still from before I was 13, even back 
you know, when I was a young kid, just out there catching bugs. I was definitely lucky and privileged enough to be able to have supportive family and go out and catch bugs all the time and be able to start volunteering at museums like this when I was a kid and never, never gave it up. Let's see. And so once I had my videos made, um, I had to think about how I was going to distribute this survey. And what I did is I, you know, got into contact with public programs and they were nice enough to lend me a cart in order to stand out on the museum floor and actually distribute the survey. And so a bit of the th things I had on my car is I had an iPad, which had the survey and the videos on it. I had QR codes so other people could take the survey if the iPad was in use. I also had a pair of headphones in case they couldn't hear it played out loud if it was loud in the museum. Um, and I had some things that really showed that I was, you know, part of Cal Academy. I had a hat and a lab coat. I had a sign that invited people to come talk to me, informing them that I was part of a student project. Um, and I also had some specimens, some uh, sand dollar skeletons, quartz, and Dr. Lauren Esposito was nice enough to lend me some arachnids encased in acrylic and some magnifying glasses. Um, and then I had a pen and notepad as well. And uh, my target audience going in was museum vi visitors. You know, these are the people who are at least a portion of them are going to be interacting with our um, social media accounts and it's kind of our target target audience but what i didn't realize is that my true target audience would in the end be their kids um i <laughs> this is a photo of me working um at my cart and you can see one person in the back um let's see if i can get my mouse over here but yeah he's taking the survey back there while I entertained the one, two, three, four, five, six, and there was a seventh kid off screen. Um, <laughs> so it was uh, a lot of energy for a single survey response. Um, and essentially what I didn't realize um, going in is that parents here with kids, you know, they're really just letting their kids go and they're following them around. The kid is in charge. And so if I can capture that kid's attention for five minutes and con you know, convince their parent that they have five minutes to take my survey, that's the most effective way for me to get responses. Um, and so, <laughs> It was a lot of, you know, counting arachnid legs. How many legs does a scorpion have? How many legs does, you know, this spider have? What do they have in common? Things like that. Um, and it was pretty fun, but it was very tiring. <laughs> um, and so what was actually on that iPad that I was handing out to people? What, uh, you know, what was my survey? And so before they watched the video, I had a few different questions. Um, I asked, what is your familiar familiarity with scientific collections? One being, I know nothing, to five being, I'm an expert. Um, and then which words do you associate with scientific collections? I had some more positive leaning words, such as um, beautiful, educational. I had some more neutral words, um, like public, cold. Um, you know, cold might be more negative in other scenarios, but I think for here, it's it's just kind of a descriptor. Um, and I also had some more negative words like grim or creepy. And uh, from uh, one a scale from one to 10, what are your general feelings towards scientific collections? Um, even if I can't tell exactly from their word associations, if they have a better sense of just like their overall feelings um, and one being negative, three being neutral, five being positive. Then I had them watch the video or one of the videos. Um, and then afterwards, I asked a very similar set of questions. The first question differed. I just asked on a scale from one to five, how much did you enjoy the video? Um, and then the second two, uh, the second and third questions were the same. I had a couple open response questions that were optional. You know, what elements of the video, if any, changed your uh, perception about scientific collections? And is there anything else I should know? And then I also asked some demographic questions, which were optional but encouraged. And I'm going to go over the aggregate data results, and then I'll go over a few of the individual survey um, highlights. And so in the end, I had 57 responses, um, 19 responses per video, and I had a lot of data. This is one, um, one of my four spreadsheets, so the social sciences do have data. Um, <laughs> it's exciting stuff. And uh, yeah, so I'm just going to go through a couple of the questions and the uh, findings that really stood out to me. So on a scale from one to five, what are your general feelings towards scientific collections? And they were very positive. I, going into this, thought it would be, you know, potentially more neutral, maybe even a little bit more negative leaning, but they were majority positive. I had zero negative responses. I had some, you know, some somewhat negative, a decent amount of neutral, but yeah, 54% positive. And then afterwards, after they watched the video, it only went up, 59% um, positive. Somewhat negative went from 7% to 3.5%, and I'm going to go over those shifts more in the next slide. 
So there was a 3.5% decrease in somewhat negative, a 7% decrease in neutral. That went from 17% of respondents to 10% of respondents, um, almost cut in half as well. And then somewhat positive and positive both shot up. So there was a shift in both directions. And then what words do you associate with scientific collections? And I took my big list of words and I put it on a scale on the x-axis so that more positive leaning are towards the left and more negative leaning are towards the right uh, with neutral in the middle. And the blue is the responses before, but just outright you can see there are a lot, people selected a lot more positive associated words than negative associated words. Um, and the blue is before, and so you can see in the more positive leading words, that red line, which is after, is above the blue line, meaning that after they watch the video, they're positive, they selected more positive, uh, positively associated words after watching the video. And then on the right side, it's the blue line is above the red line. So after watching the video, their negative associations decreased. And then just a few words that had some major shifts. I just kind of arbitrarily chose, um, picked out all the words where over 10% of respondents, um, there, was, there was a change in over 10% of respondents. So just those top six, it was a pretty clear, it pretty clearly showed that uh, more negative words such as creepy, dangerous, and unusual might be a little bit more neutral, but all of those decreased. Um, and more positive associated words, educational, entertaining, gorgeous, all increased and some individual survey highlights. So for the aesthetic video before watching the video, 21.1% of respondents described collections as dangerous. And after watching the video, 0% selected dangerous. For the impact video, before watching the video, 36.8% described collections as creepy. After watching the video, 0% selected creepy. And for the personal video, and kind of going and moving in the opposite direction, before watching the video, 15.8% of respondents described collections as accessible. And afterwards, 57.9% selected accessible. And that's, I think, very specific to Chris's video. He's talking about collecting specimens from a really young age. Um, and it didn't make it into my 60 seconds. But he actually, the specimens he collected when he was 9 and 13 years old actually ended up in the Field Museum's collections. Um, he started volunteering from a very young age. Um, but either way, you get the sense that people can go out and collect specimens. Um, and so ultimately, there weren't very large differences between each video, and each underwent very similar shifts. Just portraying collections in a positive light in general created this big shift in emotion. But the you know, specific information in each video didn't necessarily result in bigger shifts. Um, and some challenges. Obviously, videos have a lot of variables in them. There's script, you know, content in the script. There's shots between each video that overlapped. Um, for the aesthetic video in particular, it was very difficult to try and figure out what I would say in a video and how to kind of conclude it without giving a little bit more background on the Xerxes and saying that it was extinct. And so just providing that information ended up having some overlap with the impact video. And as you could see, uh, as you could see there were a lot of shots that were the same across the three videos. Um, and tech difficulties. My laptop is nine years old. It did not want to edit any of the footage that I had created. Um, and also when I was filming um, the gimbal, which you know keeps my camera steady, just was being finicky. And I had to film by hand, which uh, resulted in some shaky footage. Um, and creative writing. It was hard to write the scripts. I come from a more journalism and documentary filmmaking background. And so it's a little bit more analytical and straightforward. And so uh, creating scripts that were more flowery, had more flowery and lyrical language was very difficult for me. And survey distribution, as I said, talking to all those kids was very tiring. I, um, because of the tech difficulties, I didn't get to survey. I only had three days to distribute my survey. And so it was 10 hours across three days and it was, it was a lot. <laughs> but um, major takeaways, science education and content can have great positive impacts. Um, and short form content works. On one end, you can have these major data shifts using short videos and don't need to take up too much of people's time in order to get results in a study. And at the same time, you don't need them to become experts in a subject to have their perceptions shift. And you can, uh, my other ex major takeaway is that this can become an accessible resource. You know, collections have a history of um, colonial or have a colonial history, a lot of wealthy white men um, from the uh, global north or 
yeah, Google West, uh, West and North um, were out there collecting specimens, and it wasn't something that was shared with the greater public. Um, and even today, you know, our collections, it's difficult to tour them. The public don't have complete access to them. And so as the Academy works to make these collections more accessible and digitize them, it should also be, it might be valuable to invest energy into also creating additional like public outreach um, and tools in order to engage the public in these collections and let them know that these aren't just for researchers. These are something that they can access and they can learn about and giving them the tools to actually navigate those collections. Um, and if more students and non-scientists know how to access those collections, like think about people like Chris, if they have experiences like Chris and can, they might be able to find new education and career pathways. And looking forward, additional data analysis. Um, I would love to compare the incoming knowledge of scientific collections to how much their perceptions changed. Um, and just, and also I was serving in front of the Hidden Wonders exhibit, which is, you know, a collections associated, uh, talking with public programs. It at first made sense for me to survey there just because then I seemed a little bit more cohesive with the exhibit. But at the same time, I wasn't always able to tell if people had already gone through the exhibit or not. And so being able to ask a question about whether or not they have seen the exhibit would be a great thing if anyone ev ever repeats this study. New audiences though, what if I surveyed people in Golden Gate Park? What if I distributed this survey online? How would that change my responses? Um, and then other communication forms. What if you did you know, use an academic journal um, or a documentary film, or even if people took a class that worked and get engaged with scientific collections, would they have similar shifts to such a short video or would you have a lot like greater, smaller shifts? And then real reactions on social media. How would people actually engage with these videos online? We didn't do it as part of the study initially because if there's so many variables, you know, the algorithm will distribute it differently. Um, but just out of just general curiosity, well, how many likes will it get? How many, you know, how, what would people respond in the comments? Um, and then, yeah. And then thank you so much to so many people who have helped me out this summer um, and made this possible. Um, my mentors, Laurel Allen and Aria, um, and then Dr. Rebecca Johnson and Dr. Lauren Esposito and Kate uh, Montana and Jacob Gourneau for putting together SSI and running it, um, and Chris Grinter for, you know, taking the time to meet with me and allowing and guiding me through the collection um, and letting me film him. It was really wonderful getting to know him a little bit. And the rest of the digital engagement team, Christina Fong, Darian Fiorino, Eric Wang. <laughs> I see Eric in the back. Um, yeah, it was wonderful to be able to pick your brains and learn a little bit more about what you do here. And the public programs team for setting me up, Kyle Foster, Aya Yamamoto, Elise Rickard, um, and all of the co lecturers, collection staff, advisors, everyone who's helped out at SSI this summer, and all of the other interns. It's been wonderful getting to know everyone. But yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll take any questions. So, lots of questions. Okay. <laughs> yeah, fantastic talk, Brenda. That was thank so you. interesting. Thank you. Um, my question is: Did you happen to notice any correspondence between the level of experience that someone previously had with collections and then how they? responded before and after the survey? So that's what I would really love because I have that data, but I just didn't have time to analyze it. And so even if I had, you know, another week, I could take that question and compare it to how large of a shift they had. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Uh, whoever made that frog video that you showed in the beginning must be a really cool person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think you touched on this a little bit with, um, sampling different audiences. And I think, uh, naturally, you might come across a bias by just interviewing museum visitors that you might get these people who are a bit more receptive to science in general. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, on platforms such as TikTok, where your videos can just be served to any random anyone on the app, do you think, uh, do you think there might be like lower shifts in attitude when showing these videos? Because naturally, these people just might be slightly less receptive or, uh, receptive to science and collections and things like that uh, on the whole? Yeah, I've, I've come up with a bunch of different hypotheses and kind of gone both ways on that before. You know, if, if they're coming in with no knowledge at all of scientific collections, it might be very easy to shift them in from neutral to positive, and you might have even greater shifts. Or at the same time, it's really just not something they're interested in or have any interest in at all. Um, and so in the end, maybe there aren't as big shifts, but I think I'd have to put it into practice to know. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I 
my question is uh, in on social media platforms where people might not have as much experience, um, they also similarly can turn away from content. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you had any insight as to like, whether or not people were fully engaged the entire time, uh, the duration of your videos, or if there was ever any sense of people being disinterested and, and the in-person like swiping away as you might like, on TikTok. Yeah. Yeah, that was, um, I think it's just serving in a museum atmosphere was the biggest factor for that. Um, there were a lot of kids would come up and be interested in the specimens, even if their parents weren't taking the survey. And if I had someone already taking the survey, getting swarmed by kids, it only happened like one or two times. But I did stress out a little bit about how that was affecting their experience. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I don't know. But there are a lot of factors that go into just like surveying people on a museum floor. Yeah. Um, first, I just want to say thank you. This is a really cool um, research that you're doing. And I think it's fun to get science out to the community and really show that like anyone can be engaged in science. Mm -hmm. It's really good for like, inclusivity and um, just getting engagement out there. Um, but my question was, so from what I understood from your presentation, you let each person that came up to your booth watch one video and then they would fill out the survey before and after. I was wondering if you think that maybe you would see a shift in perspective when you paired different videos together, like if um, this were to actually go out on social media, if you were to pair the aesthetic one and then the impact one, or you know, like how people view the videos in what order they view them and how they get the content, if that would change the way they perceive the collections in science. Yeah, I think just all of these questions so far just show that there's a lot of a lot of room for further research. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I would love to also, you know, do that study. And it's a great question. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm curious what your survey pool, like what the number was of the total people yeah, it was um, 57 people were surveyed in the end across three days and 10 hours. Um, I wanted minimum 50, and that was like very minimum. Um, I would have loved way more, of course. Any person who's collecting data always wants more data. Um, but, and yeah, it was 19 responses per uh, per video as well. So, yeah. I have a really quick question, which is that I know that you asked for demographic information, did you happen to see any sort of like correlation between like demographic status and their responses? Like were like, like was age a factor where people that were older, you know, more or less interested or like felt more or less positive about it? Yeah, again, I don't know. Right. I, <laughs> I know, I have, it's, I have so much data that I'm excited to work with. Um, and that's something that can easily be analyzed. But I think I was mainly using demographic questions just to make sure that I had similar demographics across all three videos. So. Thank you. Yeah. That was really great. And so exciting yeah. for a scientist that also wants to be the star of my own video. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. So here's the hardest question of all. Oh, no. Do you have a favorite? A favorite video? Uh-huh. Of those three? It's like picking your favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> um. Probably the impact video. I think making Chris's video was my most enjoyable experience, just getting to know Chris. But I think the impact video and just the story of the restoration project that the Xerxes is you know, involved in is really powerful and really interesting. Hi. I'm interested in, I've seen other a lot of other science videos on Instagram Reels, and I'm interested in your choice on audio um, and also on captions, because I know captions um, can increase understanding or accessibility. And then with audio, there's sometimes like music or certain trending sounds that um, capture more interest or, you know, a trend that's going on in social media. So I'm interested in your choice on audio and captions. Yeah. Part of my... I had wanted to include captions initially, but because I had so many editing difficulties, I 
it took me a while to be able to find a computer that I could work with. Um, Aria actually had to work from home for a day and lend me her work computer. And I edited all the videos in one day and it was a whole whirlwind. So because I only had a single eight hour work day to edit the videos, I wasn't able to add captions. And I thought about adding music, but I wasn't sure if that would create additional bias by having different music across the videos and if I could find a song that would fit the tone of each video. Um, so that's another aspect. Yeah. And you can reach out to me at climatecalacademy.org and on LinkedIn. <laughs> All right, awesome. Well, we had a great introduction to our last, but certainly not least, presentation of the symposium. Uh, so next up, we have Alizé Gamber. Uh, who's joining us from right here at the University of San Francisco. Um, she was advised this summer by Dr. Jarell Kapan uh, with help from Matt Van Dam, Athena Lam, and Chris Grinter. Um, and she'll be speaking on surrogates for extinct species, identifying an ecological and evolutionary stand-in for the extinct Xerxes blue butterfly. Sorry, I was making sure I'm adjusted on the camera here. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be presenting my project and thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Lauren. Um, so I will be presenting my summer research project on the Xerxes blue butterfly. This butterfly is the first known invertebrate to go into extinction from human caused habitat loss. And this is their story. So as thank, thankfully we had a, a wonderful introduction thanks to Clarissa, so I'm sure we know about this. So on the left, you will find a dorsal and ventral image of the male Xerxes blue butterfly. And then in the middle, you will see, a, you will see an image of, a, it's an old photograph of undulating coastal sand dunes that once covered the westernmost outer lands of San Francisco, which is now most commonly known as the foggy Richmond and sunset residential areas. Before urbanization, Xerxes once thrived on these coastal sand dunes. They fed and laid eggs on an airy yellow shrub known as deerweed. This is their host plant, as you see here. However, as we know, Xerxes blue did not survive through the drastic change of urbanization of San Francisco. With the loss of the dunes, their host plants were nowhere to be found and their habitat was lost. Today, you can only, the world can only find Xerxes in museum collections like the one that California Academy of Sciences has. Although extinction is a permanent consequence, there is still hope in restoring this picturesque scene of fluttery blue butterflies in San Francisco. There has been an exciting collaborative effort between the National Park Services, the Presidio Trust, Revive and Restore, and the California Academy of Sciences. That's a lot of partnerships. <laughs> <laughs> Together, they are paving the way to identify and introduce a closely related butterfly that can stand in ecologically for Xerxes at San Francisco's Presidio National Park and their newly restored sand dunes. So as you see here in this image, there's Presidio and the newly restored sand dunes is in the Presidio. So yeah, exciting stuff. Okay, so my focus this summer was to help identify a potential source population that could be successfully reintroduced into the newly restored sand dunes. The closest living relative the Xerxes blue has is Glycopsyche lygdamus, or most commonly known as the silvery blue butterfly. However, there are num numerous subspecies to choose from, hence the start of my very lengthy investigation. Here is a little background. Xerxes was considered a species by early experts, but some literature noted some similarities between Xerxes and silvery blue butterflies. Since then, there has been numerous debates of whether or not Xerxes is its own species or a subspecies of the silvery blue. Since Xerxes is extinct and the taxonomic status disagreement is difficult to resolve because we cannot simply ask the Xerxes through mate choice trials and hybridization studies, therefore, for now, we will reference them as an extinct taxon until experts can come to a mutual agreement. In this image, there are four male dorsal wings 
and the blue arrow highlights the three most common, common subspecies of the silvery blues. Now, re remember these names. I'm going to be repeating these a lot. So we have Incognitus, Sabulosa, and Australis. And again, this is just like their ventral wings of the Xerxes, Incognitus, Sabulosa, and Australis. Since we are working with an extinct species, we depend on visual observations to note the phenotypic relations between the Xerxes and the silvery blue's most common form. With our close observations, the goal is to understand their genomic and ecological aff affiliations. Affinities, I'm so sorry. <laughs> now that we know that subspecies of the silvery blue that I am investigating, I will now share the barriers that needed to be addressed before choosing a potential stand-in species. So when helping to choose a surrogate species, there are numerous factors at play. This summer, I was able to contribute to finding answers that address the following three main variables. Genetics. What subspecies is most genetically similar to Xerxes? Climate. Is this subspecies equipped to handle the climate in the Presidio of San Francisco? And finally, host plant. Can the subspecies adopt deerweed to be their host plant? I will now explore the genomic aspect of this investigation. Fortunately, when I came into the academy, I did not have to start the genomics part of the project from scratch. DNA samples were extracted from the museum's collections of the Xerxes and the silvery blue butterflies collected out in the field. Then the DNA samples were prepared and sequenced. Next, the genetic sequencing results came back and they were aligned to a silvery blue butterfly's reference genomes using the code. And this is all thanks to Athena, Matt, and Jim. So in the first weeks of my internships, I was handed five glycosyche ligdomus that were collected in the field by Durrell and Chris to use as specimen for DNA extraction and sequencing. And this is my experience. One, Matt taught me how to gently collect the legs of the specimens with, with keeping the integrity of the butterfly. Two, Athena guided me through the whole library kit preparation for Illumina. Three, Athena redid my libraries when my DNA <laughs> results were low. So thank you very much. Huge shout out. Um, and lastly, I learned using DNA beads in the lab. It's an art form and I need more practice. Um, so moving on. So once the library kits were prepared, they were outsourced to Illumina, which is a next generation sequencing company that houses technology that can sequence the entire genomes of the specimens. The genomes returned, but it was not enough time to load the libraries by this presentation date. However, they will be used soon in the future to further compare the genetic differences between glycosyche ligdomus collected in the field and the museum specimens of Xerxes. Since the genomes are still being processed, this is the existing data collected by Athena, Matt, Chris, David, Jim, and Darrell. Sorry, it's a big team. <laughs> um, so as so these two images um, show, so I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna decode it first. So first in red, you will see the Xerxes. And in black, you will see the Incognitus subspecies. And then in blue, you will see the subspecies Sabulosa and Astralis. So essentially what these two tables are, or what these two images are showing is that Xerxes doesn't differentiate from Incognitus. However, they are different from the Sapulosa and the Australis. So that is the genomic data that we have currently right now. However, so moving on to the ecological niche model. Before I even got to create my ecological niche model, I digitalized the museum's collections of silvery blue butterflies. I started by organizing 298 of glycosyche ligdomus by locality and phenotypes. Next, I entered all the data handwritten on the labels into the CAS data system known as Monarch. And this is an amazing source. It is open to the public, which shares the CAS specimens and allows for more accessibility. So I was really happy to do it. Then I geo-referenced the collections by batches based on the, the locality on the labels and my newly learned knowledge of the glycosyche ligdomus habitats. Next, I revisited the collections and made determinations of what I thought each individual subspecies was. Afterwards, I updated Monarch and those 
determinations and the data were automatically uploaded to GBIF data system, which is another kind of open source. A lot of people use it to, you know, obtain data. So again, really happy I was able to digitalize all these. Afterwards, um, oh, sorry, lastly, we downloaded all the data on the Xerces glycopsychi lictimus subspecies from GBIF to make our ecological niche model. So we had and cheat sheet. So Wallace has been a great tool to assist in creating an ecological niche model to help determine the dimensions of the environments that are best suitable for each given taxon. Wallace gave us a workflow to access a very large number of modules in our studio to gather data and build and assess the models. To create the no models, Wallace uses present, sorry, Wallace uses present records, um, absent points, environmental climate layers and dimension reduction. So our end goal here was to create an, eco an ecological model that compared the environments of where the silvery blue butterflies are found in the environment of, and where the environment of the Xerces blue butterfly. So yeah, so anybody can use this. Um, it's a self-taught program, so highly recommend. It does take um, several hours, but yes, you can do it. Um, so, so into Wallace, we loaded more than 2,000 records of Xerces and the Glycopsyche lictimus subspecies from GBIF, from GBIF into Wallace. Sorry, I like all these names. <laughs> okay. Um, so Wallace was able to illustrate the occurrence on the map, starting with the Xerces. So we can see that the Xerces is unique to the city of San Francisco. Next is the subspecies in Conidas. We see that there are many concentrated in the Bay Area and up to Sacramento. Then we have subspecies Sabulosa. There, are piece, there appears to be fewer records, but they're mainly concentrated in Monterey County, where I'm also from. Um, so lastly, we have subspecies Australis. Here we see that they're mostly concentrated in Southern California, like Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, and San Diego. So essentially what Wallace does is they use bioclimatic variables. And these variables are from monthly temperatures and precipitation to develop a model to show the climate variation of where silvery blue butterflies are found in California and where Xerces used to be found. This temperature and precipitation data is collected from various weather stations and are projected into multiple resolution models. So here is just a graph that summarizes the bioclim variables for the area that harbors Xerces and Lictimus from California and certain randomly chosen background points from where their respective ranges are. From this, we can see the widespread Glycopsyche Lictimus shown in red occupies more niche space. On the x-axis, we have principal component one, which goes up with decreasing temperature in coldest, wettest months and increased precipitation in the driest, warmest times of the year. So I put these little images, so hopefully it helps make sense. It's kind of a lot. <laughs> um, on the white axis, we have the principal component two, which goes up with decreasing variability in temperature and increasing precipitation in the coldest, wettest times of the years. Principal components one and two are going to be used for the following analysis. So in this model, we treat Xerces as its own species and compare it, its environment to those of the silvery blue butterflies across California. We find that the environment of the Xerces is, there we go. So we find that the environment of the Xerces is actually enveloped by the Glycopsyche lictimus environment. And then on the right, we can find the results of the similarity test. And I will decode this for you, okay? So since the p-value is less than 0.05, we can consider that the two species are more similar than random. <laughs> so in these ecological niche models, we treat, so in these ones, we treat Xerces as a subspecies of glycosyclic the Glycopsyche lictimus and compare it to the environments to the other subspecies. So as we can see here, the ones that have the most overlap is the Inconidus and then the Xerces right here. 
And as we, if we can remember back to the other slides, Australis is from Southern California and Sabulosa is actually from Monterey County. So although Monterey County is two hours south from San Francisco, it does experience warmer days and less precipitation. Therefore, there's very minimal overlap. And again, if we look at Australis, Australis is from Southern California. As we can all assume, LA is sunnier than San Francisco. So yeah, so LA experiences more sunnier days and less precipitation. So as we can find, the main takeaway here is that in both models, whether Xerxes was treated as a, its own species or a subspecies, it overlapped with Incognitus the most. Okay, so here is the output of the Maxent models. These models predict the greatest project, projected presence back to San Francisco. Okay, so starting on the left, we see that Incognitus types are widely spread and they are fine, their most predicted suitable habitat is concentrated on coastal areas. Next, in the middle, we see that Sabulosa type, the most suitable predicted habitat is the Marina Dunes, Salinas, and North End of Big Sur. And then on the right, we see that the predicted most suitable habitat for Australis is near Santa Barbara, LA, and San Diego. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to be moving on. Oh, I'm so sorry. I guess my slides didn't load. Okay. So the, I'm going to explain to you the importance of this. So as we all know, if we can see in the in Canitas, um image here, so if we look at San Francisco, it's this model is basically saying that Incanitas can live in San Francisco. And then we had another question of whether Sabulosa and Australis can live in San Francisco. And there is another image that was supposed to be here, but... Um, technical difficulties, um, but essentially Sabulosa and Astralis, when we did a model, we, we tweaked the bioclim um, variables, Sabulosa and Astralis were able to live in San Francisco. So we have a very big range of populations that we can choose from. So moving on to the literature. So this literature from the 1950s uh, confirmed that Xerxes host plant is the deerweed. Then we use records from iNaturalist and, and GBIF to find, to find if other subspecies use deerweed as their host plant. However, we also found that aside from deerweed, there are also common host plants within these subspecies, such as lupin and vetch. And then here's just a table basically summarizing all the GBIF and iNaturalist um, data that we found here. Um, so as we can see here, Xerxes fed on deerweed, which we know, and then Australis also uses deerweed as their host plant and lupins. And then Sabulosa needs more study, but as of right now, we also know that it feeds on deerweed. So overall, there needs to be more host records in order um, from each of these plants. And then to conclude my investigation, I'm going to be summarizing the three investigation points that I researched this summer. So Xerxes is Geno genomically most similar to Incognitus. Xerxes climate niche is contained is, oh, I'm so sorry. Xerxes climate niche is most similar to that of the subspecies of Incognitus. And then the ho according from the host plant data, Xerxes eats deerweed, Sabulosa and Australis also eats deerweed, but Incognitus eats vetch. So if we were to reintroduce um, the Incognitus subspecies, we would have to plant some vetch. That's just a a future plan. <laughs> um, okay, so of course, this is an ongoing project with many partnerships and many, <laughs> with many, many um, research and just like tweaking out every single thing. Um, so this is like the three main points that need to happen, which is um, photographing the rest of the collections. We still have to properly identify the subspecies of the collections that we have. Um, and then just refine the modeling process of Wallace. Um, this was a very new application and very little people used it. And then um, Darrell and I worked hand in hand on this project to learn about it and to also um, just see how far we can take the ecological niche model. So that's definitely another point. Another um, thing that we would have to research more is the host plant models and seeing if we can, um, if we can track more Xerxes populations due to the host plant records. 
And lastly, I would just like to say a huge thank you to everyone in this program, Rebecca, Lauren, Athena, Matthew, Chris, Sarah, and Darrell. Um, I was lucky enough to have a multidimensional mentorship. So I, I, it was an amazing experience and I learned a lot from every single person that I interacted with. And I thank the NSF for funding and California Academy Scientists, the Sciences for funding as well and just this opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one, did you wear blue today on purpose? <laughs> two, uh, I'm sure with uh, reintroducing a surrogate species and possibly even introducing new plant life to an area, I'm sure there's lots of due diligence being done to find out whether those things are compatible. Uh, but what steps do you think might need to be done to specifically ensure that introducing these things not only uh, is like a good fit for the environment, but also prevents those introductions from causing more harm than good uh, if something gets overlooked? Yes, absolutely. So to answer your first question, yes, I did wear blue because of this presentation. Um, I had to dial it back. I was going to wear a blue dress. Um, to answer your second part of the question, so we're not, I feel like there's not much of a fear of like the ecological like negative impacts because there was already a butterfly in this area and it actually lived in like in this residence area was in the Presidio and there are newly restored dunes that already have deer weed on them. So it's just more like bringing back an ancient ecological like um, dune system. But however, we, I'm sure the team is taking it very seriously that there are, there potentially are repercussions. And that's why it, there's a lot of red tape and there's a lot of stages throughout this project. And I just had the small part of just kind of pointing like, hey, like the subspecies in Canada, it's like, that seems, I think that's a good fit. Or like, hey, we should test, uh, genomically test that more. Or, hey, Sabulosa, uh, Sabulosa is from Monterey. Like um, here, I can show you. Um, I had to cut out a lot of slides. I have a, a lot to talk. Okay, so Sabulosa is found in Grapata, I'm sorry, Grapata State Park, which is in Big Sur. And as you can see here, they have very, very similar climates to the Presidio of San Francisco. So a lot of this is taken into account, like yeah, Inconidus is genetically similar, but however, Sabulosa lives in the same environment. So like I said, at multiple stages, but however, we are very hopeful that there is going to be a blue butterfly um, flying in the Presidio soon. Uh, hi, that was a great talk. I, um, at least for what I gather from your results, it sounds like the best contender, at least so far in terms of looking at their genomic and ecological niche data that the Incognitos um, subspecies is kind of like the best one to introduce so far, as far as you know, uh, or, you know, for what's done by your study. But I was wondering if, uh, since you mentioned that they seem to have matched us like their, um, uh, host plant of a, a choice, I guess. Is, is, is there any sort of like areas of concern in terms of introducing that to those restored areas? That, as far as you know, like in terms of their life histories, the way that that behaves uh, in comparison to um, what was there one that you were waiting for? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. We do not want to be introducing an invasive species that's going to um, compete with other resources for other um, plants and vegetation that's there. Um, therefore, there, I'm not a botanist, so I cannot say exactly what the vetch behavior is. However, there needs to be more studies on um, what is the host plant of in Canidas, because as of right now, we just know that's vetch. However, it could be deer weed as well. We just need to have people out in the field really during the times where they're out and about and then just really observe them in different areas. Um, like I said, they're all over the San Francisco Bay Area and they're also in Sacramento. So maybe the ones in Sacramento actually feed off of deer weed. Um, so like I said, we just need to have more fields um, work to confirm that. 
but yes, um, that is a really good question though. Thank you. Hello. Uh, it's a great talk. I'm really excited about this project as someone who lives in the outer sunset. And I also um, am out in this ecosystem a lot. So as an iNaturalist user, I'm wondering if there's currently a way, I don't think there is, but maybe we can ask iNaturalist to actually have two species um, on one observation, um, or if you know that that's a possibility or if we can. Um, and then the other question is like, what parts of the butterfly should we take pictures of to help with identification? Great question, thank you so much. So there's actually an iNaturalist project like that um, is in partnership with this too. Um, if we look here, I actually have the perfect image for this. Okay, um, let me see, let me see, let me see. Sorry, okay, so if you're an iNaturalist user, this is what I would recommend. So if you see these butterflies, try to get this part of their wing where the spots are, because the spots is where we identify between the subspecies. As we can see here, this is actually a very interesting image from iNaturalist. These are two lictimus butterflies. However, the spots look very different. So we do hypothesize that there is some sort of blending and mixing of the two. Um, did I answer all your parts of the question? Okay, yes, but yeah, try to get the spots. That helps out a lot. And there's already, um, if you want, talk to Jarrell, and there's already a project on iNaturalist that you can join. Oh, is there a way to put two species on one observation on, on the app? Yeah, so this image, um, so and with iNaturalist, from what I understand, you take a photo and then other community members label it. However, in this one, if this photo was published or like was it is posted, but you would say left butterfly is incognitus, right butterfly is sabulosa. But yes, but if you see it in this, like they're together, yeah. In the, in the most place that we noticed, in the special fields, oh, okay. and the, you have to search pretty much all the fields because there are multiple fields mm -hmm. that have interacted to say, Post Association or Plants Association or is on earweed. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and um, we can throw up our project throughout this presentation. <laughs> and we forgot it all around. One of the cool things is that you can annotate other people's photos too. So, like, you can upload this photo just of the butterflies, and then someone else, like Jarrell or Alize, could go through and be like, on earweed. Like, so you don't necessarily have to do that. Other people can annotate your photos. Cool. Yeah. Uh, hey, um, so I, um, last year was an SSI student. I did my project on Tresselia and then also got to um, help out in entomology and, and hang out with the Xerxes and the um, Incognitus. Um, so it's been a really nice uh, thing to see both of those projects presented. Um, and as a Bay Area person too, um, I'm curious, if you think that there's anything that the average uh, like San Francisco Bay Area person can do in terms of their own residential land use mm -hmm. to help out these surrogate um, species. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, first, you can be an iNaturalist user. And if whenever you go out and hikes in Marin, Oakland, or Berkeley, you know, bring your phone with you, especially when it is that springtime, they normally are flying around between I would say April to June. And, you know, to, again, take photos of this side of the wings with the dots. And then if you want to help um, support these species, you can plant some deer weed um, or just donate to these conservation acts and these um, ecological restoration acts as well. Hi, that was a great job. I, I love your talk. And I was really impressed by like the myriad of um, analyses you did. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, that's what, that's what a lot. <laughs> yeah, me uh, too. <laughs> so congratulations. Thank you. Um, my question is if you know if there are any differences in predators between um, Xerxes and Silvery Blue, and if that might affect the success of a reintroduction. Oh. That is a great question. Um, I did not study predators, unfortunately. Um, if I do continue this research, I will look into that. Um, but yes, 
from what I can assume is that they would be up against the same predators of the Xerxes. Um, but as of right now, I don't, I'm not an expert in that, but thank you so much. That is definitely a hole in my presentation. <laughs> Hi, so we have a question from YouTube viewer Marcella who says, thanks for your presentation. How would you modify your niche models to include or account for climate change? Oh, great idea. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately this internship was only nine weeks long. <laughs> And, um, <laughs> but no, but on Wallace, there is a tab where you can predict future climate. Um, that would just have to be probably like a week's worth more of coding, but Wallace does al also offer that. But yes, that is something that is in an, also the next stages because obviously climate change is inevitable. The San Francisco is be going to be feeling it if we're not already. And therefore we also need to consider that when we're reintroducing a species, we want to make sure that they are successful and they're not going to be impacted by some weird climate um, uh, happenings or like the repercussions of climate change. But yeah, no, amazing question. Um, there is a tab on Wallace and hopefully we can answer your question within the next couple months or hopefully next year. But yeah, but thank you. That's mind blowing. You did such an amazing job. Thank you so much. So my question is, you did field work, collection digitization, genomics in the lab, <laughs> and coding. Which was your favorite thing? That is, oh. <laughs> <Let me think. laughs> um, actually, I would say, um, I have a photo for this too. I would say field work. Um, I've never caught butterflies before. And it was just mind blowing to me that I went to Caples um, with you and Darrell and everyone else. And you just handed me a net and you said, go for it. <laughs> and I apparently, Darrell says that I'm pretty good at catching butterflies. Uh, but yeah, so I actually caught this big, like yellow butterfly. I wasn't able to, I no, I was able to identify it, but I for, did forget the name. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> what is it called? I'm sorry. Small, small, small tail, swallow tail, swallow tail. Um, but I would just say go. I and also when we went down to Big Sur and we were just carrying these big nets like on the side of like the highway and people were like, "What are they doing? Like, what are you catching?" And it was like so fun to explain to them like, "Oh, we're doing research from like the California Academy of Sciences. Like, we're looking for like the species that we're potentially like reintroducing." So I would say field work, just getting out in nature, going on trails. And then just interacting with everyone else on the team. And yeah, I mean, catching butterflies. The good thing is this swallowtail I did release. Um, but <laughs> I don't know if I would have a different fe feeling if I was collecting them. But but yes. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for that question. But I would say everything that I did this summer was very beneficial. Um, coding is not necessarily my favorite, but I have done it a lot and <laughs> I have done it a lot. I know coding is the future, so there's no, <laughs> you know, you, you can't avoid it. So I just, you know, I think I just need to get better then I'll start liking it. But, yeah. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> That's the end of our talks. Maybe everybody can just join me in thanking all the speakers one more time. Uh, and for those interns, uh, mentors, mentorship teams, uh, other invalued persons, invalued? I don't know if that's a word, but anyway. <laughs> and people that are really important. Invaluable, invaluable. Invaluable, that's one. Uh, we're going to have a toast uh, to celebrate the end of our summer up on L3 West balcony uh, in 15 minutes. So please join us to congratulate the interns and great job. Great summer. Great job.